Hi everyone, Steve here, and today I've got a project with my Commodore 16. I'm going to increase the memory capacity of this computer from 16 kilobytes to 64 kilobytes, but I'm going to do it in a non-intrusive way. I've got a little circuit board I've designed, and this will allow me to increase the memory capacity without cutting traces or lifting pins, as is commonly recommended in other implementations of this mod. In the later half of this video, we'll explain why this modification works, and we'll take a look at some schematics that allow it to happen. So without further ado, let's open this thing up, and let's get right to work with the modification. So this is the inside of my Commodore 16, and I've already gone ahead and removed the RF shield that covers this circuit board. Uh, there were solder points that I had to desolder to remove the RF shield, six total around the perimeter, uh, and that may or may not be the case on your board as there are several revisions of this computer. And the chips we'll be working with today are in this section of the board. They are specifically these four chips. The two that I'm indexing right now are the RAM chips that we will replace. And these two over here are the multiplexers that allow the CPU to address various parts of those RAM chips. I've already gone ahead and socketed all the chips that we're going to be working with. In fact, I've socketed all the logic chips on this side of the board. It's not required, but it certainly helps for maintenance, especially if you're pulling chips in and out of this board regularly. I'll link to a pair of videos below that show some techniques on how to remove these chips if you're not familiar with doing so, but to get started, you will have to have these removed in order to apply this modification. And then the last thing we'll need to do is to run a pair of wires from these ICs all the way across to this area of the CPU on the system board. We'll need to hook up to pins 21 and 22 on the CPU or to various test points that exist on this side of the board. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. The existing RAM ICs are the TMS44161500 NL by Texas Instruments. They are eight kilobyte modules that operate at 115 nanoseconds. We'll need to replace those modules with the ones that are commonly found in a Commodore 64. These are 32 kilobyte modules, and I'm using the NEC branded 41464s with 100 nanosecond access time. Uh, another common module model number that's available is a 4464. That is also a 32 kilobyte module. And we'll need to just make sure that regardless of which module you choose, that the access time is 150 nanoseconds or faster. So anything below 150 nanoseconds should suffice. So here's a close-up of the circuit board we'll be working with, as well as some of the components you would expect to find in a kit. I also have a DuPont wire or a DuPont cable, female to female, that I'll be using to connect uh, this circuit board to the address lines on the CPU, and I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So let's zoom into this board to see what it looks like. Bring it into focus. Okay, so this is the top side of the board, and the bottom side is pretty much identical, except it has a bottom marker so that you know which side goes facing into the system board. And this is actually two circuit boards that are put together, uh, and that's just a quirk of the manufacturing process that I selected. I basically just take a saw or a tool and I cut straight down the middle, and then I file off the ends so that it's nice and smooth. So in fact, what we're going to be using are two of these tiny little boards over here. And once these are fully assembled with these components, they basically fit right into the spots that I noted earlier. Uh, the 74LS257s, um, U8 and U7, I think it is. Yes, U7 and U8 are the components that are going to be intercepted by this board. And the assembly of one of these modules is fairly straightforward. There's a slight order of operations that we need to take into consideration, given that there's a small footprint of the overall board. The first thing I do is I take one of these headers and I install it uh, directly underneath where the socket is going to be. Oops, that's the wrong slot. It should be this one. Okay, so this header shows up underneath or directly underneath where the socket is going to go. Uh, and then I take my socket and I install it on top after soldering the header. And of course, uh, once I, it's a little bit tight to get in there, but uh, then I put the next header in and the remaining uh, three and one pin headers. I have already assembled one of these for closer inspection. It looks like this. Now, because this circuit board sits between the multiplexer chip and the system board, 
we don't have to do any trace cutting or pin lifting because that break of connection is implemented in this board. And it's also effectively controlled by this jumper as well. The jumper lets you select between 32 kilobytes of addressing for the one multiplexer module or 64 kilobytes for both and equivalently reverting back to the stock behavior of uh, 16 kilobytes total for the whole system only by moving that jumper across. Uh, some people opt to implement a switch, a physical switch on the outside of their box uh, and you can totally do that with this implementation as well because you would just wire the switch up to these headers as opposed to using the, the jumper for selection. Finally, this angled header over here is what connects to the addressing line on the CPU. Each of the two modules has a specific pin that you'd have to connect to. This one is pin 22 on U2, which is the CPU, and the other one is pin 21. We'll show that in a moment. All right, the two modules are assembled, so let's head back to the Commodore 16, install them, and hook them up to the CPU's addressing lines. Okay, we're back at the Commodore 16 and our next step is to expose the two address lines from the CPU so that they'll be accessible to the new interfacing board for the multiplexer chips. Now, if you're wondering what this 6510 is doing inside of my Commodore 16, I'll link to a video where I describe the adapter board that I'm using so that I can use this 6510 inside of this architecture. This PCB implements Andrew Chalice's adapter for the 6510 so that it can be used in the 264 series machines, the Commodore 16, Commodore Plus 4, and the Commodore 116. But for the time being, I'm going to remove the CPU as it will simplify locating the address lines that we have to tap into. The address lines that we need are located on pins 21 and 22 of the CPU, and I want to probe this area of the board because I know that there are some of these vias or test points that expose pins 21 and 22 and it's a lot easier to hook up into these vias than it is to solder a uh, wire underneath the board or onto one of these pins. I have my multimeter set to continuity mode and you can hear it beep when the continuity is detected and I'm going to start looking uh, for pin 21 which is this one and it's one of these two up here. Okay there it is. So pin 21 on the CPU maps to the second test point from the left side, or from the right side of the RF modulator. And it shouldn't map to any of these other ones. Right. Now these test points down here also map to the address lines we're interested in. And I think 21 is one of these three. There it is. So this one is 21. And when we probe for 22, that's this one over here. Now, the reason why I don't like using these two addressing test points is because the pin spacing between these two test points is greater than 2.5 millimeters or 2.5 millimeter pitch. And that means I can't just stick an arbitrary pin header in these holes without separating the pin headers. It's a lot easier to use the ones up here because these ones are in fact 2.5 millimeter pitch. And when I look for pin 22, there it is, it's the first one. So in this project, I am going to use these two pins or these two test points right here and install a pin header in them. And then I'm gonna run that wire around and to the modules on this side uh, to interface against the adapter board.
All right, the hard part is done. I've installed and soldered the header that will allow us to interface with the address pins for the CPU. Uh, next, I'll replace these RAM modules and then install the PCB over top of these sockets. So next I'll replace the 74LS257, specifically the one for U8. That's U8. As I'm installing this, the, you'll notice that there's ample clearance around the entire socket. And when I initially designed this, I think I got the dimensions correct so that you can install this board directly into the system board and not have it interfere with this resistor pack or anything that's around it. Um, and that has yet to be verified, but by looking at this, I think it will work. There should be enough clearance and there should be enough clearance on a Commodore 116 as well. Again, the 116 is fully compatible with the Commodore 16. It's the same architecture and you can apply a similar modification to it. So I will list the specifications and the dimensions of this board. And then if you were intending on installing it directly into the system board and not in a socket in either the Commodore 16 or the Commodore 116, then you can confirm with those dimensions to see if it will fit in there. And I'm also making sure that I'm installing these in the correct orientation. The notch is on the left side of this socket and also marked pin one is also marked on the circuit board. So we can correlate that to the pin one on the insertion point that's on the system board. And now I'm just replacing the 74LS257 modules. seated properly. Okay, let's go ahead and install the DuPont cable for the addressing lines. And in checking my notes, the leftmost terminal is the address line for pin 22. So the black wire should go to U8 and the white wire should go to U7. All right, and I'll tidy this up later on, but the last thing we need to do is install the CPU once again, or else none of this will work. And there we go. So let's hook up this bad boy to a uh, screen and let's get this thing tested out and see if we can address 64 kilobytes of RAM. Okay, so we're hooked up to a video source and I'll overlay the output somewhere on this area of the screen. I've got my two adapter boards hooked up and I've both set them up in the 16 kilobyte mode. So in this configuration, we should be seeing the stock 16 kilobytes of RAM when we power on. And just by inspection and from the overhead view of this camera, it looks like both of these boards will indeed just fit directly into the system board and they don't need a riser from a socket to be installed. This one here might need a little bit of adjustment. It looks like I didn't do that great of a job filing down the edge when I separated the two boards uh, in their factory configuration, but otherwise everything looks pretty tidy. Anyway, let's power this thing on and let's see what happens. Hey, hey, look at that. 
12277 bytes free. That is indeed the stock RAM configuration of the Commodore 16. All right, let's power this thing off and let's give it a shot in the 64K mode. So I'm going to have to adjust these jumpers and put them both on the right. Now this should give us access to the full 32 kilobytes of each of these memory modules and let's give it a go. Boom, 60671, that's the number I want to see. So this is working quite well and I'm quite happy on how this turned out. Now a definitive test of this arrangement will require a Diag 264 module so that we can both test the addressing and the viability of these memory chips. I don't have one of those on hand, but I plan to make one in the future and I will present the results of that test when it becomes available. Now, if you're interested in obtaining a pair of these PCBs or even the kit, check my eBay listings below in the description. I might have some available when you're viewing this video. And if not, just follow up with me. I can always produce uh, an order or a, a batch of these from the factory if there's enough interest to do so. Now, if you're interested in understanding how this modification works, Stick around for a few minutes as we'll jump right into the schematics and take a look at what makes these two multiplexer modules tick along with the RAM that we've selected uh, in this system board. So whenever we do some kind of hardware analysis on the 264 series of machines, it always helps to look at the plus four first since it often has the superset of all the hardware features that are available in the other machines of the series. This schematic is from the plus four and it shows where the addressing lines from the CPU go to get at memory. You can see that in the middle of the page, we have the two multiplexers that are taking the 16 address lines from the CPU and it's switching between pairs of eights to access DRAM. Now it's important to understand a little bit about how DRAM works because it will give us our first clue as to why this modification is successful. DRAM or dynamic RAM is typically organized in rows and columns of memory on the physical chip. And you get at those rows and columns of memory by first providing an address to get a row and then providing an address to get a column and then doing the read or write operation. And the way you differentiate between a row or a column address is by setting the RAS or CAS selection line on the physical memory. You can see the RAS and CAS selection line is originating from the TED chip, the 7360. And that's important because we know it's going to work the exact same way in all of the TED series of machines because they all have a TED chip. They all have the same TED chip. So the timing of the RAS and CAS signal is always going to be the same on every machine. And it's also going to work the same way, regardless of what address is being passed to the memory. Now let's look back at the multiplexer chips on the plus four. You'll see that the first output of the multiplexer chip is an 8-bit address and that probably corresponds to the row of the memory we're selecting and the second output of the multiplexer chip is also an 8-bit address most likely corresponding to the column of select memory selection so 16 bits total to represent an address and that's effectively the entire address range that we would expect on a 64 kilobyte machine no problems here so now let's go back to the Commodore 16 and take a look at its schematic and see how it differs. Well, we can see that we still have the same two multiplexers. The RAS and CAS lines are still controlled by the TED as expected, but the addresses that are output from the multiplexers are slightly different. On the first set of outputs, we get an 8-bit address from A0 to A7, but on the second set, some of the address lines are hard-coded to a plus five volt signal. So in total, there are 14 bits being used for addressing. Two to the power of 14 is four times less than what the plus four has, which corresponds to, again, the total amount of memory that's available on the Commodore 16. 16 kilobytes instead of 64 kilobytes. But the hard-coding of these outputs to five volts has an interesting side effect on the memory that's being viewed by the CPU. When the CPU generates the full spectrum of addresses across its 16 address lines, two of those bits are always going to be the same. And that means that some of the memory addresses on the memory chip are going to be duplicated. So if we don't want that duplication, then all we have to do is hook up the missing address lines from the CPU into the multiplexer, which is precisely what we did in the modification. 
So that takes care of memory selection, but what about the physical memory module? Can we just copy what the plus four does and hope for the best? Unfortunately not, and that's evident by this schematic which shows the memory modules of the plus four computer. So the Commodore 16 uses two eight kilobyte memory modules, but here we can see that the plus four uses eight eight kilobyte memory modules. So we can't just use the same modules that the plus four does because there's eight of them and we only have space for two of them in the Commodore 16. So let's take a quick look at the Commodore 16's memory module data sheet. This is the TMS 4416 and we can see that it's an 18 pin chip that effectively has eight kilobytes organized uh, by four bits. It would be nice if we could find a pin compatible chip that just stores more memory. And that's where the 41464 module comes into play because it meets both of those requirements. It has the same pin layout, the same number of pins, and it organizes 32 kilobytes of RAM in the same fashion that the TMS 4416 does. In fact, if you took the 41464 and placed it in the Commodore 16 and did not perform the address line modification, it would still work because it's pin compatible. It's just that a bunch of its memory will not be used. And so there you have it. That's why we can perform this modification of our Commodore 16 and make it behave like a Commodore Plus 4 in terms of memory management. I'd like to give a big thanks to Dave Curran at Tynemouth Software. Big apologies if I'm mispronouncing either of those names. Dave made a blog post about this project in 2019 and went into lots of the details that I've skipped over in this presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this modification, I'll have a link to his blog and his archive link to the blog post below where you can review it at your leisure. Thank you for watching and as usual, I hope you found this information useful. Hope to see you back soon.